for finally in chapter 2 of Ruth. Finally in chapter 2. And I even, this, we're going to go through one verse 1 through 14. And I tried to even split it up even more. I actually shortened it and cut, cut it off at verse 14 and did 15 and 18 for lesson 7. And that was, I couldn't cut 1 through 14 because it, it all flows in together and I couldn't just stop in the middle. So I couldn't break this up anymore. So it worked out perfect. I was supposed to do it last week, but, you know, God had other plans. Even though I was ready to do it, I was all ready. God just got up. And sometimes that guy, jeez. All right, so verse 1. And Naomi had a kinsman. Of her husband, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech. Mighty man, the Hebrew word for might is gibor, which means powerful. And a mighty man of valor. This implies that Boaz was influential, powerful, compatible, prominent, and wealthy. Now the author is telling us about this here. Okay, that's very important. This is not a conversation going on between Naomi and Ruth. The author is telling us what is to come. So he's kind of giving us a hint and saying, hey, there's hope for them because there's a kingsman that can redeem them. So this is the author telling us this is not a conversation between Naomi and Ruth. Elimelech, Boaz was a man of standing in the community. He was a capable and a man of valor in the area. Boaz was a near relative of Naomi's husband. The law of the kinsman redeemer. The kinsman redeemer is a male relative who, according to various laws, had the privilege or responsibility to act on behalf of a relative who was in trouble, danger, or need. The Hebrew term goel for kinsman redeemer designates one who delivers or rescues or redeems property or person. The kinsman who redeems or vindicates a relative is illustrated most clearly in the book of Ruth, where the kinsman redeemer is Boaz. <laughs> the nearest kinsman or kinsman redeemer, kinsman, kinsman right, the nearest kinsman or kin kinsman redeemer is Goel. The word means to redeem, receive, or buy back. Provision was made in the law of Moses by the poor person who was forced to sell part of his property or himself into slavery. His nearest kin could step in and buy back what his relative was forced to sell. The, king, the kinsman redeemer was a rich benefactor or person who frees the debtor by paying the ransom price. If a fellow countryman of yours becomes so poor he has to sell part of his property, then his nearest kinsman is to come and buy back what his relative has sold. The nearest of kin had the responsibility of redeeming his kinsman's, his kinsman's lost opportunities. If a person was forced into slavery, the redeemer purchased his freedom. When debt threatened to overwhelm him, the kinsman stepped in to redeem his homestead and let the family live. If a family member died without an heir, the kinsman gave his name by marrying the widow and rearing a son to hand down in his name. So now, this is a very important aspect because if a wife died, if, if a husband died and there was a relative, and that relative would marry the widow and they would have a child, that child is actually not that father's in a sense. By, by blood it is, but they were meant to keep that heir in the family by the deceased husband. So that child kind of was, was relative to the, to the husband that died because that's what, it, that's what they were supposed to do. The name, that kid, the son, was supposed to be more relative in turn to the husband who could not produce the kid for the widow. When death came at the hands of another man, the Redeemer activated as the avenger of blood and pursued the killer. Goel was used of things consecrated to God of God as redeeming man and those redeemed by God. The right of redemption and the office belonged to the nearest kinsman 
or near of kin, near relative. God is the great kinsman of his people. The Israelites' liberty was lost in Egypt, and he rescued them from bondage, which is just one example of God's grace. Job complained that no one came to redeem him. His faith is seen reaching out and proclaiming that God will provide his goel. Job 19.25, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Job's hope looked to the coming Messiah. He affirmed his faith that his Redeemer will come to earth. Four things are required to be a kinsman to redeem. He must be near of kin. He must be able to redeem. He must be free of any calamity or need of redemption of himself. He must be willing to redeem. And redemption was completed when the price was completely paid in full. So the second part to that verse, and his name was Boaz. The last part of this scripture teaches us how to distinguish good men from bad men. Now this is a very interesting thing when you're starting to read the Bible, okay? Notice the verse says his name was Boaz, okay? His name was, and then insert name. In the case of wicked men, their names were given before the word name. Oh, God. So, Goliath was his name. Right. Nabal was his name. But the name of righteous were preceded by the word name before. His name was Kish. His name was Saul. His name was Jesse. His name was Mordecai. So you can see here that the Bible will actually distinguish good and bad by how they introduce the name of a person. So if their name is before his name, he's a wicked person. If, it, if his name is after his name, he's a righteous person. The righteous men of valor were acknowledged in this manner because they resembled their creator, of whom it was written in Exodus 3. I am who I am, which is translated in the Hebrew as I am the name. Great. So, let's talk about Boaz so we understand Boaz for a little bit. Matthew 1 and 5. And Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. Rahab was the mother of Boaz. Now, this is very important. Rahab spelled R-A-C-H-A-B. And Rahab, spelled R-A-H-A-B, are the same person. They're the same person. Okay? The Old Testament is the R-A-C-H-A-B. The Old Testament renders the name from the literal spelling in Greek. However, this was changed in the New Testament to R-A-H-A-B. So these two women are the same person, just spelled differently from how the Old Testament distinguished her from the New Testament. <laughs> Joshua 2, 1 through 21, and Joshua 6, 22 through 25 talk about Rahab and her backstory. Like Ruth, Rahab had not been born in Israel. Rahab was a Gentile prostitute living in Jericho prior to the conversion. Jericho was the first city conquered by Joshua when the Israelites came into the land of Canaan. Rahab believed in Israel's God and by faith hid Israel's spies when they entered Jericho to spy out the city. Some of us can kind of remember the story now. Rahab helped the spies by letting them escape down the rope through the window which her house had been built into the wall of the city. When Jericho was conquered by Israel, God spared her life and the lives of her family because of her faith and her earlier courageous actions. Afterward, Rahab put her faith in God. She was saved by grace. God honored her faith by allowing her to be in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Now, I think it's a fascinating, this is a fascinating side note, is the Old Testament, they lived by the law. There really wasn't grace back then like we live in. We live in the dispensation of grace. But I think it's fascinating to see how many people were saved by grace yeah. in the Old Testament. Right. Yeah. That goes to show you how awesome God is that even though yeah. they lived by the law, God still had grace even during those times. Because yeah. a lot of people were saved by grace right. in the Old Testament. 
That's good. Yep. Verse 2. And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me go. Ruth took action. She did not stay and wait for her new God to do something for her. She took action. See, I think that's something wrong with today's Christians. We know what it's like to have God provide for us. However, sometimes we get in a state of mind in which if I just have faith, God will drop it in my lap. I've seen it done before. We've seen that where it just is a blessing dropped in our lap. But God blesses us and does drop things in our lap. But it requires some action on our part. Sometimes it takes more than just faith for a blessing to come. Here we have Ruth, all of the gods, little G, she has ever served, never did anything for her. How could they? They're not real. Right. 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 Yeah. Right. Absolutely. To the field and glean ears of corn after him. Now we know it was the time for barley harvest, and during that time extra hands were needed to reap and harvest the grain. But it was also a time of gleaning. This practice of gleaning allowed the poor to go into the fields after the harvesters picking up the grain that was left behind along with the grain that landowners were required to leave at the edges of the field. So part of the law, the landowners were supposed to leave 10% of the grain behind in the field to let the poor come in and take it. The next part of that verse, in whose sight I shall find grace. It's an also interesting note that she was already thinking more than just getting leftovers. She wanted to find grace in someone's eyes. She could have said, let me just go get that 10% that is allotted to us as, as poor widows and bring that back. She said, no, let me find grace in someone. She didn't need grace to go and pick up what poor people were given to her by the law. She didn't need grace to do that. That was by law. She was obligated. She could do that. She could go to any field and reap any leftover of that 10%. But you know what she said? You know what she had? She had a mindset of her tomorrow. She said, in whose sight I shall. She did not say, in whose sight I hope to find grace. Good. She said, shall. Good. Shall means expressing the future tense and expressing a strong assertion or intention. We must have the mindset of the next level. Yeah. I've talked about it many times. You cannot go into the next level without first having the mindset right. you're there. You can't start thinking about the next level until you get there. That's not how it works. You don't think about the next level when you're there. Yeah. You need to start living your life and having a life in Christ, you need to start having a mentality of your next level. Now, it's true, we don't know what our next level will bring. But we need to have a mindset and a vision of what it could be and its potential for our life, for the kingdom. Is. Right. You need to start sacrificing and preparing now. You need to start thinking of your tomorrow now and how it will be better for you. You need to be thinking of your new souls that you'll be winning. You need to believe in your lost loved ones that are saved today. Yes, amen. Uh -huh. You need to start thinking you are not in debt today. Come on, right? You need to start thinking about growth and putting it into practice now so you can be ready for that next level. Uh -huh. Come on. This is why we try and be professional and we try to do things in the church because there's expectations and there's structure. We need to be prepared for when we're running hundreds of people. Right. We need to act like our tomorrow is today. Amen. So when we get to those hundred people, uh -huh. then our next step is we start thinking about those thousands of yeah. people. Yeah. Right. We must have the mindset of our next level and yeah. act like we are already there. Yeah. 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 Right. right, it's good. Now there were so many... The four messages that Pastor and I heard at a couple weekends conference ago, they were all 
just great. They were so powerful. And the pastor mentioned it last week, the last, the last pastor who preached was Pastor Cornwell. And as I was going through this on our way home, I was amazed with almost how every single four preachings <laughs> correlated with what I'm going through here in Ruth. Right. And I was just reading, I was like, man, I, I got that in these notes. Well, let me kind of add a little bit since I got a little bit more nuggets from this guy and, and, and see if I can deliver some more. Right. And his title was the second portion, Post-Pandemic Revival. Be careful, don't preach my message. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going too far. <laughs> You'll just get a little taste. Okay? All right, all right. Take a he talked about how Elijah took Elisha on a journey. There it goes. <laughs> I'm hooking him in for you. I'm hooking him in. All right. He's giving his bait. At the end of the journey, Elisha asks for a double portion. All right. All right. Now, Pastor Cornwell was prophesying that after this pandemic there was going to be a revival sweeping across the world that we had not seen before. Right. Yes. And as us Christians, as people who need to be ready for this, we need to be ready That's right. for that devil portion. That's right. Because if we are not, that portion will move over us. Right. Yeah. Onto someone else. We must be in the mindset that people are going to be hungry for something that has truth. Something that has integrity. Something that is real. We need to be ready for the next level because it is just beyond our reach. We are right there at a verge of a breakthrough. And if we are not ready and prepared for the mindset, we're going to miss it. Yeah, that's right. mm -hmm. The next part of that verse, and she said unto her, Go, my daughter. This whole verse is Ruth asking permission to Naomi about this. Ruth is really, in a sense, asking Naomi, Do I have your permission to go out and do this? Thankfully, Naomi still had some faith right. to let Ruth do this. She could have said, no, it's, it's too dangerous for you. The chances of you finding favor in someone's eyes, a Moabite woman, are next to none. They're right. right. She did not say that. She said, no. Right. Verse 3. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. When someone gleaned, they were walking after the reapers and gathering whatever remained. The law of gleaning was a Jewish law. This tells me, this tells us, that Naomi was already telling Ruth about the laws of the Jews. Because Ruth asked to go out and do this. She's not going to know about this law. She's from... Moab. So Ruth, or so Naomi is already talking to Ruth about their laws and their do's and their don'ts. I mean, a seven day journey is quite a long time to be with someone to talk about something. So right. might as well talk about what you're about to get into as far as right. a religion goes. <laughs> right. This was no. Uh, lost my spot. Ruth would need to know these laws if she was to be part of the Jewish people. We can only assume that Naomi told this on their journey back to Bethlehem. And her hat was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. Right. God allowed Ruth to go to Boaz's field by divine design. Right. Yeah. Do you know how many fields there must have been that she could have picked from? Right. We have no idea where this field was located to their homestead. She could have passed by. She could have had some that were right there by across. We have no idea how many landowners there were doing this. How many fields could Ruth have picked to glean from? 
This was no chance, though. Because this is the providence of God. We see both Ruth's actions and God's providence working together in this verse. Remember, Ruth was a foreigner, so she would not have known what field to go to or who owned the various fields. She wouldn't have known, hey, that's Boaz's field. Because as of right now, Naomi and Ruth had no idea about Boaz at this moment. Conversations had not talked about it yet. So she did not know that was Boaz's field. Right. And even if she had a name, she would not know that that was a near kinsman to her. The next part of the verse. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers. The word behold focuses attention on the arrival of the owner of the harvest field, Boaz. This emphasizes the arrival at the field of Boaz from Bethlehem and Ruth's approximately the same time. This was a critical act that God orchestrated. Each time the word behold occurs in the book of Ruth, it indicates the hand of God on that scene. Some experts say that it was not normal for the owner of the land to go to the field in which they were harvesting. Why would the boss right. need to come and see what's going on? That's why he had a servant over the reapers. Yeah, right. So there's no reason for the boss to come down and look to see what's going on. They say this was a divine nature to put God, to have God put Boaz in the field the same day he could spot the reapers. The Lord be with you, and they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Boaz's noble character was displayed in his care for his workers. Even his greeting to them was in the name of the Lord. So Boaz was really a high character. I mean, he even greeted his servants with high standing. Verse 5. Then said Boaz unto his servant, that was set over the reapers. Whose damsel is this? Boaz recognized there was a stranger in their midst. When it was harvest time, they probably had a lot of the same poor people coming back to pick up the leftovers year after year. And they probably know him from the city or whatnot. They see him around. But there was a new one who was added to this field. The question Boaz asked is very interesting because he did not seek Ruth's name. But instead, her relationship. Whose damsel is this? People will often do this with us. They don't care about our name, but they care about the identity of us. Yeah. What church does that person go to? Who, who's their pastor? Right. People care who you identify with. That's true. Now, we can see this on both sides of the coin. So be careful what you do. Say and act around people, yeah. both good and both bad. Boaz noticed something about Ruth. Something caught his eye. We need to have a beautiful inside, so when someone sees us, they don't see our outside. Instead, they see what's inside of us. We want someone to see what God sees. Ruth was out there begging in a field. It was hot. It was humid. She was probably sweaty, covered in the excess of wheat. The Bible doesn't even tell us that she had proper amenities to keep herself bathed and clean. Right. We don't know if she even had a mirror to look at to see if she could get her hair all did. We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us that. The Bible indicates nothing on her looks. To make sure her clothes were just right. We know that Boaz must have had plenty of women around him. People who, who he dines with. Trying to set him up with their daughters. Hey Boaz, why don't you marry my daughter? I'm sure he had some fine scenery every day around him. It's not like he doesn't have any options. <laughs> As I said from my readings, the Bible does not mention Ruth's looks. It doesn't 
matter what our outward appearance is, though. Because all she said, all Ruth said was, just let me glean a little bit that I may find favor. She had the mindset of, I don't care what Boaz has seen. Mm -hmm. That's right. Because once he sees me, it's game over. <laughs> Did you know that people see you how you view yourself? That's why you attract the losers and the ugly people. Because that's how you view yourself inside. Preach it now. No one cares about negative people. People who are oppressed. People who take and take. This type of person never leaves a legacy. Just pain and suffering. If you are like this, you will live a miserable life and have no one to care when you die. People will actually be more than glad when you are gone because all you did was create chaos when you were living. You just crushed dreams, pulled people down further and further. Judgment will not be easy on this person. These type of people go into the ground with more people happy they are dead than they wish they were alive. Why do we not know about the other ten spies? Why does the Bible never mention Orpha again? Mm -hmm. The way you perceive yourself is the way others perceive you. Right. If you want to change how others see you, then you need to start changing how you see yourself. Woo. It is pointless to try and change someone's mind. What do you think about yourself while you are alone staring in the mirror? I'm pretty sure First Lady had a, had a message where it said, look in the mirror or your reflection. I'm pretty sure First Lady kind of touched on this. Maybe that's why our circle looks the way it does. Why all our friends are depressed instead of cleaning up your circle. Why don't you start by cleaning up your inside? And yourself. What you accept in life speaks volumes on how you see yourself. When you start to clean yourself up, just watch the environment around you begin to dissipate because that environment can no longer survive on how you are changing your life. When you change your inside, that crowd you hang around with will begin to leave. Yep, that's true. Why? Because they start viewing you in a different light, and they want nothing to do with yeah, what you're changing into. That's right. Sometimes you don't have to disown the friend. Sometimes the friend will disown you because they see what you're turning that's into, right. and they're like, "I want no part of that." That's right. That's right. Yep. Amen. Verse six. The servant mentions twice about her Moab bloodline and notes she came with Naomi. Why not just say she's with Naomi? All Boaz asked was whose damsel is this? He could have simply said, it's Naomi's daughter-in-law. But instead, the servant mentions twice in the scripture about her Moabite lineage. The foreman put emphasis on Ruth's heritage, highlighting her Gentile background. However, he also indicated her connection to Elimelech, Naomi's deceased husband, which would tie her to Boaz himself. The answer to Boaz's question was that Ruth belonged to Naomi. Right. Verse right. 7. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheep." Now, this is still a conversation between the foreman and Ruth. Okay? Okay. The foreman indicated that Ruth asked permission to follow the harvesters after they finished reaping. So this is a conversation between Ruth and the foreman when she first arrived in the field. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now, that she tarried a little in the house. So the foreman, still conversation with Boaz, he pointed out her persistence and hard work. Now this 
As I said, this is important. This is not a conversation between Boaz and Ruth yet. This is the foreman telling Boaz of the foreman and Ruth's conversation. In this scripture, the servant is telling Boaz what Ruth said to him. We can see this because of how the verse 6 ends. It ends with a colon, which means verse 7 is a continuation of verse 6. Right. In verse 6, we see that Boaz is talking to his servant. But at verse 7, there is a period which tells us this conversation has ended. So after hearing this, Boaz goes and then talks to Ruth. And this is what we see in verse 8. Now we're not quite there yet, but I want you to make sure you get the picture of where we are at in this story. Just like in previous scriptures, this shows us Ruth's characteristics and her heart. Ruth asked for permission to glean the harvest fields, even though by law she could do it. She humbled herself and still asked for permission to glean in the field. This illustrates a perfect Christ-like person. Yes. Even though it was owed to her, even though there was a law stating she could do this, she still asked for permission. How many of us would do the same? How many of us would ask for permission even though we had every right to do something, we had a law to back us up doing it, how many of us would just do it because that was obligated to us instead of still asking permission to do it? Right. Verse 8. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Harvest thou not, my daughter. Now this is the verse that begins a conversation between Boaz and Ruth. Ruth set herself apart from all the other gleaners in the field or women for that matter, that drew attention to her. It is also important to note, he says, my daughter. Now, I have ran into two ideas when it comes to this very statement. I'm going to go over both of them. If Boaz and Ruth were the same age, or if Boaz was older, and actually Boaz being Naomi's age. Now, there's two theories here. I've dug into both to try and find an answer for you guys. When Boaz states, my daughter, some believe this implies there is a difference in their age. Not a couple years, we're talking much older, 20 years or so. We also see evidence of this very thing in Ruth 3 and 10 that supports this when Boaz praised Ruth for not going after younger men. So there's kind of a... This, this kind of points more to that he, Boaz was actually older than Ruth by a significant amount. However, in Ruth 3.10, there is more in that scripture than, that, than just that statement. Others believe the term daughter was applied, in, applied to relationships other than one's immediate progeny. For example, under certain circumstances, the term referred to a sister, an adopted daughter, a daughter-in-law, a granddaughter. The Hebrew word for daughter is bath, is rendered granddaughter, and a descendant. So there's all of these terminologies that the word daughter is used, but they're used in many different contexts. Yeah. Aside from these direct relatives, the term daughter was applied to women in general. Women of a particular land, people, or city and female worshippers of false gods. So even daughter, that was actually female worshippers of false gods at a certain point in the Bible. It was used as a general address of kindness by one with authority or by an older person to younger women. Forms of the word bath are also used when referring to branches of a tree in dependent towns of a larger city. The term for daughter, right, sometimes we say... I have a daughter work. Churches will have daughter works. It's a, it's a different church, but it falls under that church. That's what we're talking about here. The term for daughter, in its many senses, occurs over 600 times in the Bible. As Boaz's actions, not only was he respectable and a wealthy man, but God-fearing man as well. As you can see, there are arguments for both sides. Which one is right? You make that decision. 
I don't get paid enough to tell you what <laughs> I'm just revealing it to us to have our minds open and not closed-minded when it comes to it. Now, go not to glean in another field. Neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Boaz's noble character is again on display in his kind words for Ruth. Ruth would be able to collect more grain with Boaz's maidens than with the gleaners. So she's no longer part of the gleaners. She's no longer part of the poor people picking up the 10%. She's part of her maidens picking up Boaz's stuff. Right, right. He literally puts her with his people collecting the barley. This was an act of undaltered grace. Just as Boaz told Ruth to stay in his field, God wants us to stay in his field. We have no need to go wandering off into other fields, right. seeking fulfillment elsewhere. Right. The world will dangle other fields in, our, in front of us, such as success, pleasure, money, That's and good. many other things. That's a good point. But these fields are dangerous. Yes. God has provided protection and everything we need with him. Remember, a famine in the house of God is a lot better than an abundance in a cursed land. Yes. Right. Amen. Verse 9. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Boaz is telling Ruth to keep reaping in his field. He is encouraging to say, hey, stay here, be with my maidens. Stay steadfast in my field, and go nowhere else. <clears throat> Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? Now, gleaning could be dangerous for the poor, especially for foreign women, because they're just poor foreign women. They're just poor women. So the reapers would sometimes harass them and do things to them. And Boaz issued instructions to ensure her safety. Right. And when thou art at thirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which young men have drawn. Now, this is another critical piece because Boaz is allowing Ruth to go where their young men get their water. Right. Right. Poor people weren't allowed to do that. The gleaners weren't allowed to go where the workers went and they drank. Boaz told Ruth, hey, go where, where my young men get water. Right. Saving her a lengthy trip to a well. Right. Right. Now, he didn't have to do any of this. Verse 10. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him. Ruth's response was to prostrate herself as a mark of respect for a social superior. As a Moabitess, she could easily have been ignored by Boaz. But he had noticed her and shown kindness to her. The grace of Boaz caused Ruth to become overwhelmed by his generosity. This was especially gracious because she was a Gentile. <coughs> added to this grace that Ruth did nothing to earn it. Boaz gave Ruth his favor or grace because of her care for Naomi. He did not owe anything to her. This is the result of Boaz's question to his foreman about who, whom Ruth belonged to. Why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? Now, this is my only problem with Ruth. This one section in this verse out of us is my one problem with Ruth. My only problem with her. Why did she question Boaz when she found favor in his eyes when that's what she was trying to do anyway? Right. I mean, she said, let me go find grace in someone's eyes. Let me do this. She had the mindset. And then when it happened... I think she was a child. <laughs> she kind of questioned it like, who am I for you to do this to me? Okay. Yeah, it's the only problem I got with Ruth. This little section. Don't question when God gives you something. Just take it. <laughs> Maybe she was in shock. <laughs> There's no excuse. We see in verse 2 what her intentions were. Let me... Go into the field and glean ears of corn and loose shite. Side I shall not find favor. Yeah, she needed to provide for her, for her and Naomi, but she wanted to find grace in someone else. She wanted more than just being a better. So she found grace and 
question when the grace finally arrived at her front door. Verse 11. And Boaz answered and said unto her, Boaz is about to answer Ruth's question here in this verse. It hath fully showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thy husband. And thou hast had and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knowest not heretofore. This tells us that Boaz had to have known about Ruth. Either A, after he talked to the conversation with his foreman, he didn't go to Ruth right away and got some dirt on Ruth to find out who she was and what she did. Or, he already knew about Ruth because we know that when they first came in, Naomi was the talk of the town. So, maybe everybody knew the character of Ruth because of the backstory she had. So, Ruth could have been the talk of the town of how she had stayed with Naomi and her character and what she had had not been. So, we know that Boaz probably watched her for a little bit. He had to think about some things. He had to know about Ruth for some things. The death of a husband exhausted a daughter's, a daughter-in-law's obligation. Naomi herself had made clear in chapter 1, verse 11. Yet Ruth had remained with Naomi, leaving her own land and people, which meant entrusting her future to a favor of the deity of a new land. News traveled rapidly about how Ruth cared for Naomi. As soon as his foreman told him Ruth was who she was, he offered her his help. Boaz took note of Ruth's kindness to Naomi. Naomi had released Ruth from all legal and moral obligations for her, but Ruth continued to serve her in grace. She also embraced the God of Israel as her savior. So, I mean, she was the talk of the town. I mean, her story probably was, can you imagine this Ruth girl doing this? Why? Why? And, of course, there was probably some more fibs. The story probably got escalated a little bit, you know, spread around from person to person and person. Maybe she was, maybe all the way up here in some people's eyes because of the stories that were told about her. Verse 12, the Lord recompense thy work. And a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel. This right here, verse 12, is a prayer Boaz is praying over right now, over Ruth. Boaz was not just praying that Ruth be rewarded, but that she had a full reward. That her cup would be filled to the top. And that she would be repaid in full of her obedience to the Lord. The best part of this prayer is that Boaz himself is going to be the answer. Under whose wings thou art come to trust. The phrase under whose wings you have come for, for, rep, come for refuge refers to Ruth's belief in the God of Israel. She had come to him for protection. We can see in a correlation with Deuteronomy 32.11-12 as an eagle stirreth up her nest. Fluttereth over young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. And verse 12, so the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. We'll see another correlation with wings a little bit later on. But that's what this is referring to right now. God's covering and wings over her life. Verse 13, then she said, let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord. The word favor in Hebrew is shen, which means graciousness and kindness. Boaz was moved to show favor, grace, and kindness to Ruth. Boaz gave favor and Boaz gave favor and grace to Ruth during the days of judges. Remember, we're still in the day of judges. That time is still happening during this time. Yet, during these times, Boaz chose to live a different lifestyle. He lived counter to his culture. He was a righteous man and obeyed the Mosaic law. For that thou hast comforted me, and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid. Ruth responded, 
in humility to Boaz, she expressed gratitude for his grace, comfort, and kind words. She gave two reasons for her gratitude. The first, Boaz gave her comfort in her financial situation. And the second, Boaz expressed kind words to her. That is, he was compassionate towards her. Though I be not like unto one of thine handmaids, Ruth deemed herself low in the Israelite society. This verse tells us right here, she was amazed by Boaz's grace towards her. But again, why? Why question the very thing you wanted to happen? Now, what is favor? Favor is not God coming down and talking with you. That is not favor. Favor is God having a conversation about you to someone who has the ability to bless you. Hopefully you are not a hater of blessed people. Hopefully you honor powerful people who have the authority, who have authority and power. I pray that we are not a people who dislike people who are more blessed than us. If you are this person, I want to I want you to know that no one beneath you can bless you. You have to get under someone. You have to get under some oil. You have to get under some anointing. There is always someone watching you to see how you will respond in your struggle in life. Once you have proved to them that you can respond properly to the struggle, that is when God tells them to start moving you into a different position, into the next level. When you are struggling, you must maintain yourself because someone will see the real you at that point. Make sure you have the right attitude and you say the right words and conduct yourself in the right manner. This goes beyond way beyond a church aspect. This goes beyond our lives in every aspect. Good times do not reveal the real you. When you are in a struggle... That is who you really are. That is what your heart says. God cannot use someone whose heart is not right. Will you determine if someone will find favor from your actions? Ruth was not being watched while she's in Moab, while she's in her house, while she's married, while she's all cleaned up and bathed and scented with spices. She is being watched with all her setbacks, with the death of her husband, with the care of her mother-in-law, while begging in a field all sweaty and nasty. Did she leave at the first sign of struggles? How faithful was Ruth going to be? She didn't leave at the first sign of struggles. She could have pulled an Orpha and left Naomi. She could have gone back to her old lifestyle, Something she was familiar with. How easy it is to go back to our old ways. But Ruth didn't. She knew there was something different about Naomi and about the God she served. She chose to stay and help. She was being watched through the very trials of her life. Notice Boaz never goes and conversates with Ruth the minute he notices her. He watches her for a little. He gets some facts about her. He wants to know about her a little bit. Another concept we need to understand is favor does not come to lazy people. One thing to note is God did not give the needy a handout. They had to work hard in the hot sun doing the work of gleaning if they wanted food to eat. What does God say? Really? What does the Bible say about lazy people? We can see in 2 Thessalonians 3 and 10, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. We can look at a more powerful verse in 1 Timothy 5 and 8. But if any provide not for his own, and especially 
for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Favor comes to those who are working in the field. Favor comes to those who are making the best out of their situation. Ruth may do with what she had to do. She had a mindset of, I will go and beg, and I will get some food to survive. But whatever I do, I must provide for me and my mother-in-law. I don't care if that's all I can do. If that's the only thing I can do is to keep food on our table one day at a time, that's what I'm going to do. If only we could have the same mindset that what we're doing that day, we're going to do the best of how we can do it. If we can do the job no one wants, then you do it with everything that you've got. Favor does not come to those who are lazy and criticize others of what they are doing. We need a church full of people who say, I do not like the level that I am at, but I am going to maximize the place in which God has me right now. Samuel goes to Jesse's house and Samuel can't find the one who God wants to anoint as the next king. Samuel asks Jesse, are these all your sons? God's not giving me the green light on any of these. Jesse says, no. No, there's another one. He's working in the field. And Samuel says, I'm with the one who's working right now. Bring him in. Samuel says, go and get him. And God tells Samuel, that is my king. God chose the one who was working while the others were looking pretty in the house. God uses people who sacrifice who uses those who will work and do something with their life. Another message that fits so perfectly with Ruth was from Pastor Diaz at our conference. And his title was The Cost of Complaining. And this was such a powerful message because he hinted on so many aspects. And his main verse was Philippians 2 and 14. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. And I can't give this message justice by trying to reword it in my mind, but he had talked about how, about how we complain and how it's in our nature to complain. And we complain with really without even knowing we complain. And it was so powerful to, for him to say, no matter what you're doing, the Bible says do all things without murmurings and disputing. That means everything. All things. Whether it's your job, whether it's at the church, whether it's with your spouse, whether it's your mother or your father, it doesn't matter. Do all things without complaining is what the scripture is saying. Let's take another look at while we're talking about favor. We all know about Joseph. Joseph was the favorite of all his brothers. His brothers were okay with that until he wore the coat. Once he put the coat on, then is when their hearts turned against Joseph. People are okay with God blessing you with your job until you drive up in that new car. They're okay with those small blessings and they'll speak blessings over your life on Thursday night Bible study and oh I speak God has favor on you. And, but when you come in with a testimony saying someone just gave you a house well He's just showing off with what we don't have. Well, he's just too prideful and he's a show off of what he has. But let me tell you something. When God gives you a coat to wear, you wear it. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Don't worry about how those other people can't handle God having favor on your life. Just because they're not favored by God 
doesn't mean that you don't wear the coat. Just because people can't handle God blessing you and putting favor in your life doesn't mean you put the coat in the closet because it offends someone because their feelings may be hurt because God's not doing that for them. We've seen this. A perfect example we can see this is when Brother Dave and Sister Lisa got their house. A blessing in itself for what they got. Yes. And Brother Dave was testifying about his house, about how God was working in his life, about how he's got a car, how he's got this. And he was bragging about the coat God gave him. Right. Right. See, don't worry about other people if God gave you that coat. You keep shining that coat in the world. Regardless of what other people think of your coat. That's right. That's right. There's always going to be a hater when you wear your coat. That's, right. That's their problem, though. That's not yours. That's right. You want to know one reason why people struggle with favor coming into their life? Because no matter how much they say it, the majority of people refer to you out of a previous context. They don't like it when you're getting blessings because they see you in a previous season. They see you in a past situation in which you are the most holiest of person. They see you in a past life. And that's the only way they can see you. Favor does not come because of who you used to be. Favor takes a new context. It takes you to where you are now from where you have been brought to to a new season. And see, people have a difficult time with it because you've just moved past their level. Uh -huh. yep. And they can't see you higher. They can only prove you at the same or lower level that you were in because of your past. Yep. Right now. Yep. Verse 14. And Boaz said unto her, At mealtime, come thou hither. As a thorn gleaner, Ruth would normally have had little or nothing to eat while out in the fields. Boaz invited her to the noon meal as an expression of hospitality. This was another act of grace towards her. Because... Boaz has encouraged Ruth. And he has spoken words of kindness and comfort to her. Ruth has responded with gratefulness. And the stage is set for the next part. The invitation for mealtime. Boaz has gone beyond the Mosaic law of caring for the poor. And he will invite Ruth to his dinner table. And eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers. And she reached her parched corn, and she did eat. The vinegar was a delicacy that highlighted the meal. This was wine vinegar to moisten dry bread. The bread was roasted grain, a staple food that consisted of barley roasted on an iron plate over an open fire. It is interesting to see that Boaz ate and drank with his servants as well. He had more than a master-servant relationship with his workers. He was not embarrassed or ashamed to be seen eating a meal with his hired help. Remember, Boaz is a type of Christ That's right. in the story. Uh -huh. Just like Jesus will sit right next to us. He invites us to his table to eat. Yes, he does. If we so choose. And was suffice and left. Ruth ate so much, she would left her full. Ruth once was invited. Ruth. Once Ruth was invited to the mealtime, something changed. 
Another season had begun already. The next level was already there. She was no longer a beggar. Now, there's no romantic interest in it yet that the author has told us. This is simply demonstration of Boaz showing compassion and generosity for Ruth. Boaz's eye caught Ruth in some way, shape, or form. But this was not love, guys. Just favor. God's telling Boaz, I want you to bless her. I want you to do this for her. I want favor upon her life. Ruth has now progressed to the next level. Because there can't be any love from the level that Ruth's at right now. That, can't, that relationship can't happen where, at the level Ruth's at right now. Naomi has to go one more level. We will see this in verse 15 and 16 when, Bo, when Boaz shows us even more favor in Ruth. Now, I don't really know how to end this part. But don't be a hater to favor people. If God gives you a coat, you wear it. If someone can't handle that coat, that's their problem, not yours. Remember to always work. Always give 110% no matter what you're doing. Whether it's picking up trash or giving a Bible study. The Bible says in all things, don't complain. Don't complain about the world you're living in. Don't complain about your present situation. Don't complain about the gas prices. Don't complain about the government. Don't complain about authority set in your life. Don't complain about the church. Don't complain about your wife or your husband. Don't complain about your kids. Don't complain about your parents. Don't complain about your grandparents. Don't complain about school. The Bible says that in all things we are not to murmur. So in all things, have joy 